It's nice to be with you all uh, at this meeting of the Boston Global Forum. I'm Joe Nye, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the relations of U.S., China, and Japan uh, to start a conversation. And my colleague uh, Tom Patterson is going to raise some questions that have been uh, brought in before uh, on the internet, and so I'll spend part of the time basically outlining the problem and part of the time having a chance to answer your questions. Why focus on U.S., China, and Japan as a subject? Because it's one of the issues which, if we mismanage, could make a real mess of our century. Some people have drawn analogies to a hundred years ago in which, uh, in 1914, uh, Europe, which was at that time prosperous and was uh, high degrees of economic interdependence and where people were living quite good lives, Europe uh, tore itself apart in World War I and ceased to be the center of world affairs as a result of, of World War I. And there is a danger that some people say that the same thing could happen in terms of the relations between uh, U.S., China, and Japan. I don't think that's correct, uh, but I'll give you reasons why. But nonetheless, it is still a, an issue which has gotten a good deal of attention. There have been a number of books that have come out to commemorate the, uh, the period after the end of, uh, uh, of the century anniversary of World War I, uh, which have brought uh, forward this analogy to uh, East Asia today. And uh, it was interesting that when Prime Minister Abe of Japan was at uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum in January, he raised the question of whether uh, the relations between uh, China, U.S., and Japan uh, were reminiscent of 1914. Uh, so it's, a, it's, I think, a topic that's worthy of our taking some time to think about. Now, if I look at the, at the problems of, uh, of U.S., uh, Europe, uh, U.S., Japan, and China uh, uh, today, uh, I think that uh, there is a, we might start with the argument that uh, uh, the Obama administration has talked about a policy shift to spend more time thinking about Asia. It, it was originally called a pivot to Asia, but then it became known as a rebalancing toward Asia. And uh, one of the questions that people raise is, is that really an appropriate uh, terminology? After all, the United States never really left Asia. It, the United States is a country which, uh, geographically, one of our states is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and Guam is closer to the Asian mainland than it is to North America. In addition to that, uh, uh, the United States is very heavily economic, interdependent with Asian countries. And another thing that's interesting, given the nature of American foreign policy, is Americans, uh, our foreign policy is very heavily influenced by uh, the origins of where Americans come from. And, uh, uh, you know, originally Americans came more from Europe. But increasingly, you're seeing the influence of Asian Americans in American politics. So for a variety of reasons, geographic, uh, economic, uh, social, I don't think you could say that the United States ever left Asia or ever will. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a feeling in the uh, first 10 years of the 21st century that we were not paying enough attention to Asia. Uh, we, we became uh, deeply involved after the attacks on 9-11 uh, in Afghanistan and then uh, with the invasion of Iraq. Uh, we became, if you want, bogged down in a war in, in Iraq. Uh, and I think there was a feeling uh, by many Americans, and which was captured by President Obama, that uh, we had spent a lot of the first decade of the 21st century thinking about uh, some of the most difficult parts of the world, and we're ignore, ignoring or neglecting the area which had become the center, or was becoming the center of the world economy. 
I wrote a book um, a couple of years ago called The Future of Power, and in that I said that one of the important power shifts of the 21st century was from west to east. It was a power shift in which the uh, best way to understand it would be to think historically back to, let's say, the year 1800. In, uh, in 1800, if you looked at the world's population and the world's product, what, what, what was made, uh, you'd see that more than half was in Asia, more than half the world's population, more than half the world's product. Uh, if you fast forward that to 1900, uh, the, uh, uh, you'd notice that Asia was still more than half the world's uh, population, but it was now only 20% of the world's product. And I think what you're seeing is a long-term process in the latter part of the 20th century and in this century uh, is what you might call return to normal proportions. I would expect that by the end of this century, Asia will be, again, uh, more than half the world's product, uh, as well as having more than half the world's population. Now, this, I think, overall is a good thing. Uh, this might be called not the rise of Asia, but the recovery of Asia to normal proportions. And I think in that sense, um, what it means is that hundreds of millions of people have been raised out of poverty. And we should all be grateful for that. It means a reduction of, uh, of misery in the world, and it's a, it's a great accomplishment. It really starts, uh, to some extent, with Japan, uh, carries forward to, uh, to uh, Korea, to some of the Southeast Asian nations, uh, now very much focused on China, and increasingly, I think, will be focused on India. And uh, it's, a, it's a process which I think has been good for the world, good for Asians, but good for the rest of the world as well. But with that good news, there are some people who say there may be bad news. And the bad news argument goes something like this. Uh, very often it's said that when you have a shift of power and the rise of a new power, right now much of the attention is focused on China, uh, that this leads to instability and leads to uh, the possibility of great conflict. This, of course, was the, the famous uh, answer that the Greek historian Thucydides gave as to the origins of the Peloponnesian War, that it was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear that created in Sparta. And uh, many people transfer that to the origins of World War I that I mentioned a few minutes ago, arguing that it was caused by the rise in power of Germany and the fear that created in Britain. And some are arguing that that will be the story of our century, that uh, the rise in the power of China will create fear in the US and, and Japan, and that that could lead to another great uh, conflict between countries. Uh, there are, as I say, some political scientists who say this is the future. I don't believe that myself. Um, I think that analogy is wrong for uh, several reasons. One is that uh, uh, if you look at the story of 1914, uh, you should notice that um, the situation of Germany in 1914 was it had already passed Britain. And in that sense, uh, the, not only were the causes of World War one much more complex than just the rise of Germany. There was also the rise of Russia and the decline of Austria-Hungary and so forth. But uh, the most important thing is that uh, Germany was not only right on uh, Britain's heels, but in some dimensions was passing Britain. And that was creating a degree of anxiety. Uh, when we look at the 21st century, while there's been an impressive rise in the power of China, uh, I think if we look at all dimensions of power, uh, we do not see a China which is is uh, going to be more powerful than the U.S. for quite some time, if, if ever. Uh, how can I say that when everybody says, of course, China is going to be a bigger economy than the United States? Well, the reason I say it is that there are three dimensions of power. There's military power, 
there's economic power and there's what I've called soft power, the ability to get what you want through attraction and persuasion. And uh, even when China, if it continues at its rapid growth rate uh, and doesn't face any bumps in the road to throw it off the road, even if China does become a overall larger economy than the United States in, let's say, uh, 10 or 15 years or so, uh, that's one aspect of economic power, the total size of the economy, which gives a certain amount of market power. But there is another aspect, which is the sophistication of the economy, which is better judged by per capita uh, product. And on that, on per capita income or per capita product, uh, China, even when it becomes larger than the U.S. overall, won't be anything near the United States. Indeed, many economists say that if China continues to prosper and grow at the rate that it is now, it won't be near the United States in per capita income until sometime in the middle of the century. Uh, that's very different than, let's say, the fact that Germany had passed Britain in industrial production by the year 1900, uh, well before uh, World War I. So if we look at one of the dimensions of power and we say, is China becoming more powerful than the U.S. economically, even when it has a larger economy, it won't necessarily be more powerful than the U.S. in terms of per capita income or overall economic power. The second dimension of power that I mentioned, uh, military power, China uh, has been increasing its uh, uh, military expenditures, indeed, uh, with double-digit expenditures on its military budget uh, over recent years. Uh, the, the military budget has been growing more rapidly than the, than the economy overall. Uh, and some people say this means that China will challenge the U.S. as a global military power. But again, I think if one does a careful assessment of the numbers, you'll see that China has a long way to go in military power before it comes anywhere near the United States. China is, has indeed uh, purchased and refurbished a former Ukrainian aircraft carrier, which forms its first carrier and plans to build some war. But there's a large difference between having a single carrier, mostly now in a training role, and uh, and having, a, uh, you know, let's say a dozen or even anywhere more than five, six uh, carrier battle task forces. But uh, carriers aren't the, the only thing to think about. If you look at the ability to project military power globally, uh, China does not have that capacity. In fact, the, the United States is probably the only country in the world that has a truly global capacity to project military power. So I think when people say, well, China is, is going to equal the U.S. in military power, uh, I rather doubt it, and uh, even if someday it comes close, it'll be quite some time to come. And then on the third dimension of power that I mentioned, uh, soft power, the ability to get what you want through attraction or persuasion, uh, China has been trying to increase its soft power. Indeed, in 2007, uh, President Hu Jintao told the uh, 17th Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party that China needed to invest more in its soft power. And China's been spending billions of dollars to, to do that. Uh, you have the establishment of hundreds of Confucius Institutes and classrooms to teach Chinese culture and language around the world. You have the tra efforts to transform uh, Chinese Central Television, uh, Xinhua News Agency into global news agencies like the BBC or CNN. Uh, there are a number of efforts that China has been making to increase its soft power. And that's a very smart strategy for China. Because if you are a country whose hard power, your economic and military power, uh, is increasing rapidly, uh, there's a danger that you're going to frighten your neighbors and that they're going to form coalitions against you. But if you can combine attractiveness or soft power with your hard power, you're less likely to produce these kinds of coalitions that would make you seem uh, threatening, that would be trying to balance uh, your power. So in that sense, I think the strategy that Hu Jintao outlined in 2007, in which President Xi Jinping has 
has reiterated for, for uh, this year, uh, is a smart power strategy of combining hard and soft power. The problem, I think, is whether China can implement that uh, soft power strategy in the way it wants. And one of the difficulties there is a great deal of soft power from a country or from a society comes from its civil society. Uh, if you look at the United States, for example, a good deal of the soft power of the U.S. comes from uh, its universities or from Hollywood and not from government actions. Very often government broadcasting if it's seen as propaganda, doesn't really create much soft power. And so the secret to creating soft power is to unleash your civil society, to allow the freedoms that, uh, that encourage different groups to speak out, uh, sometimes self-critically about the country, and that gives a degree of credibility which can, uh, I think, uh, emphasize the, the, uh, the role of attractiveness of a society. And the other point, I think, that uh, China has to come to terms with as it tries to increase its uh, its soft power is the issue of uh, how it appears in the eyes of its neighbors. Uh, if China has policies in which it appears to be bullying to its neighbors, for example, on issues of the South China Sea, uh, that makes it difficult to increase its soft power. For example, when China had problems with the Philippines over the uh, so-called Scarborough Shoal, China was able to use the hard power of its uh, naval vessels to uh, prevent the Philippines from having access to the fish in, in uh, that shoal. Uh, but it meant that uh, there was resentment which was created in Manila. So the question that China would have to face is it follows a strategy of using hard power in the South China Sea to get what it wants. Uh, is that going to undercut its efforts to develop soft power through Confucius Institutes and broadcasts in, uh, and other things in national capitals. So there is still a difficulty, I think, for China in terms of developing its full soft power resources. And if you look at recent polls that have been taken by the BBC or by the Pew Trust and so forth, you'll see that China is having some difficulty on its soft power, increasing its soft power, particularly among its neighbors in Asia. So in that sense, I think the, the metaphor or the analogy in which people say that what's going to happen in East Asia today is, is going to be like 1914, that there's, a, there's a, going to be a great conflict, I think that's, uh, that that's going to be caused by uh, the rise in the power of China and the fear it creates in the United States. I think that's greatly exaggerated. Uh, China is not, in comparison to the U.S., where Germany was in comparison to Britain, in uh, 1914. And uh, so that means that, in fact, there's much more time for the United States and China to manage their relationships. There's so much uh, to be gained through cooperation uh, that in the U.S.-China relationship that uh, the competition, which is bound to be there, uh, doesn't have to be the dominant uh, strand of the relationship. Uh, if you think of the areas where China and the U.S. need to cooperate, uh, for example, uh, areas of uh, climate change, uh, areas of maintaining international monetary stability, areas of, like making sure there are no global pandemics, uh, these are things which can have extraordinarily uh, powerful effects on all societies, America, China, and others, but uh, uh, where they can't be solved by any country alone. These are not issues, these transnational issues are not ones that can be managed by just having a uh, uh, one country dictate to another. They have to be solved by, by cooperation. So for those reasons that, uh, that, first of all, I don't think China is passing the United States in overall power, and second, that there are great incentives for, for cooperation in the relationship as well as the competition. I don't think that these predictions that uh, 2014 and after will be like 1914 are very adequate ways to think about it. Indeed, if you look at the American policy toward East Asia, and, and I was involved in this in the Clinton administration in the, in the, the 1990s, the general policy that was uh, laid out in the uh, Clinton period, and which has remained the American policy since then, 
has been to uh, seek to integrate China into the world economy and to develop good relations between China, the US, and Japan, and China. You know, there's a triangle of good relations. Uh, in the 1990s, some people were arguing that uh, as China's power was rising, the United States should try to contain China. Uh, my reaction, and other people in the Clinton administration at the time, was it would not be possible to contain China, that that Cold War terminology uh, just didn't make sense. Uh, that, uh, first of all, China's neighbors weren't clear that they wanted to join an alliance to contain China. And secondly, that if you did try to contain China, you would just cause resentments and you would essentially make, uh, make for bad relations between China and the United States afterwards. So the attitude that Clinton took was uh, to uh, say, we welcome China with an open hand. And Clinton in, in supported China's joining the World Trade Organization. The United States took uh, a major trade, uh, allowed major trade with China, which was good for us, good for China, but uh, certainly wasn't anything like containment of the Cold War. The other thing, of course, is we have many, many Chinese students, 100, 200,000, I think, uh, in the United States now. And that, again, is very different from the Cold War containment where, where with the Soviet Union there were almost no such contacts. So the attitude that Clinton took was uh, invite China to participate, to be a responsible power. Uh, now, some people said, yes, but suppose China does grow strong and becomes a bully. Then what do we do? And the answer there was to say, if China becomes a bully, then others are going to want to protect and be protected from China. And in that period, the, as the United States uh, looked at this situation, we said, let's integrate China into the world economy, but as an insurance policy, or if you want to hedge our bets, uh, let's make sure that we keep good relations with other countries. And particularly, we reaffirmed the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty and Security Alliance. Uh, both Japan and the United States had to ask, how do we deal with this rise of China? China, of course, was on its way to passing Japan from being the third to the second largest economy in the world. Uh, so Japan had to think about security. The U.S. had to think about security. But at the same time, we didn't want to contain China. We wanted to integrate China. So by reaffirming the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty uh, and treating the U.S.-Japan alliance as a framework for stability, we were able to accomplish, in policy terms, uh, integration plus an insurance policy in case things went wrong. Uh, it's best illustrated, perhaps, by the fact that uh, I remember being at a summit meeting at which President Clinton met with President Jiang Zemin in 1995. And uh, Jiang Zemin asked Clinton, do you want a strong China or not? And Clinton said to him, we have much more to fear from a weak China than a strong China. And that was an invitation, essentially, to China to be a full participant. And at the same time, in 1996, Clinton and Prime Minister Hashimoto of Japan signed a declaration in Tokyo, which said that the U.S.-Japan alliance rather than being a relic of the Cold War, was the basic basis of a framework for stability in East Asia for the post-Cold War world. So those two statements, those two attitudes of the 90s in the Clinton administration were carried forward uh, by the Bush administration and then by the Obama administration uh, as the basis for how America saw this relationship. Basically, that having a triangle of good relations between the U.S., China, and Japan was the framework for stability, which would allow the East Asian economies to continue to grow and prosper in ways that benefited all three countries, uh, China, Japan, and the United States. So that has basically has been the framework for the policy uh, that the United States has tried to encourage in terms of the relations between uh, China, Japan, and the U.S. Now, having said this, that's a, the framework, uh, what could go wrong? 
Uh, and one of the things that could possibly go wrong, I think, is that not that leaders would want a war, but that something could happen in terms of miscalculations. Let me give you some examples from the current dispute that exists between Japan and China over what China calls the Daiyu Islands and what Japan calls the Senkaku Islands. This is about seven or eight square kilometers of barren rocks or islets, uh, uh, which uh, in the East China Sea. Uh, but what we're finding is that there's incursions of ships and planes uh, uh, which are challenging each other. And there's always a danger that somebody is going to make a mistake and that things will get out of hand. Let me give you an example, or uh, well, let me first give you a little history and then, then an example of how this could happen. In 1972, when uh, uh, the United States uh, handed back Okinawa to Japan after World War II, uh, the United States had controlled the Senkaku Daiyu Islands uh, as part of its uh, control of Okinawa uh, after the war. And when it returned the territory of Okinawa to Japan, it included the islands as part of that uh, handover. And in that sense, uh, Japan has had administrative control because the Americans had administrative control of the islands. But it was a problem because in China's view, this did not mean that Japan had sovereignty over the islands, and uh, yet Japan felt it did have sovereignty over the islands. So when Japan and China were trying to normalize their relationship in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, then Prime Minister Kakuei Tanaka of Japan and Zhou Enlai of China met and they were arranging this normalization and Tanaka said to uh, Zhou Enlai, what should we do about these islands, these little islands in the East China Sea? Uh, and Zhou Enlai uh, I think made a very wise decision. He said, let's leave this off for other generations. If we try to solve this now, we're not going to be able to solve our issues of normalization. Let's put it off for future generations. That was wise because essentially it meant that for decades to come, while Chinese ships would, saw, would sail into the area and sometimes be challenged by the Japanese, uh, basically uh, there was no incident which disrupted the relationship between the countries. That began to, and as late as 2008, uh, China and Japan were able to sign an agreement uh, on the, how they, in principle, they could jointly uh, exploit any oil and gas would be, which would be found in disputed waters. But uh, this came to an end uh, in 2010. What happened in 2010 is a Chinese fishing trawler bashed into a Japanese Coast Guard boat, not once but twice, uh, and the Japanese arrested the, the ship and the captain and the crew, and uh, when they took them back to uh, uh, Japan, uh, the uh, Chinese protested. The Japanese then released the crew but not the captain, who they said had been drunk and uh, disorderly and deliberately bashed into the ship. And China took offense at that and said, if we uh, allow you to put this captain on trial, it means that we're accepting your sovereignty because and your legal system. Uh, so we refused that. And eventually this led to a dispute which escalated to the point where China uh, embargoed its uh, uh, export of rare earths to Japan, which is a very serious uh, measure, and that stopped for those exports stopped for for a couple of months, even after Japan decided to send the captain of the trawler back to to China. Uh, the interesting point is that it had a very negative effect on public opinion in both countries, increasing nationalism, increasing hostility toward the other country. And uh, that was the circumstance that was, uh, that was in place when in 2012, uh, Prime Minister Noda of Japan at that time uh, decided to purchase three of the islands, these little barren islands. And the reason he did that was that uh, 
Governor Ishihara of Tokyo was going to use money from the municipality of Tokyo to purchase the islands, uh, and he was going to do that to stir up trouble with China. So Prime Minister Noda basically was saying, if the central government of Japan purchases the islands, we, we can prevent them being misused this way. Uh, China didn't see it that way. China saw it as a disruption of the status quo by using uh, government money to, in their view, nationalize the islands. And that led to anti-Japanese riots in China, to a decrease in trade between Japan and China in 2012. Uh, I was sent by, uh, with all, some other former officials, I was sent by uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton at the time uh, to uh, talk to Chinese and Japanese leaders about uh, the American interest here, which was to keep the situation calm and not to see uh, this dispute escalate. That a dispute between the second and third largest economies in the world would be bad for everybody. What I was impressed with as we met the leaders of, of China and Japan was that they did not want war. They didn't want this to escalate. But the question was, could they avoid any miscalculations that would get out of hand in the future? And there, there is something to remember in terms of uh, not only the incident in 2010, where the, in the trawler captain bashing into the Japanese Coast Guard ship was not something ordered by Beijing, but something which once it happened in a climate of nationalism became difficult to manage. Uh, but if you go back to a case where the analogy with uh, 1914 might make some sense, sometimes statesmen wind up being trapped by events which are more or less accidents or miscalculations and things then escalate beyond where they'd like them to be. So if you look at the situation in 1914, there was a lot of economic interdependence between uh, Germany and Britain and other European countries. But uh, the, uh, uh, nobody would have predicted at the beginning of the year there'd be a war. And the only country that wanted war was Austria. Uh, but the war that Austria wanted was a short war in the Balkans what you might call uh, the Third Balkan War. Of course, the net result of one event leading to another following after the assassination of an Austrian Archduke in Sarajevo was that you had a four-year war uh, which killed 20 million people and which led to uh, uh, the end of Europe being the center of, of, of world politics. Uh, so miscalculations sometimes occur in human History. And if I look at the situation in East Asia today, the relations of U.S., Japan, and China, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, in fact, there are strong enough interests and strong enough interdependence and, uh, between the uh, three countries that uh, war is not likely. But as we know, humans are fallible. Uh, human systems are fallible. And sometimes through miscalculation, we wind up in places where nobody originally intended to be. So I would summarize this, uh, this description of the situation uh, of, of the relations of uh, US, China, and Japan in East Asia today as one where, in fact, there's a lot to be gained from cooperation. There are some dangers of miscalculation. I don't expect that they'll get out of hand. But unless we pay careful attention, there's always the risk of being taken by surprise. And that's why on this 100th anniversary, it's worth our attention to making sure that we improve communications, uh, avoid the danger of, of letting nationalism get so strong that if a miscalculation occurs, uh, political leaders feel their hands are tied. And uh, that, I think, would be the the moral of the story of what I'm talking about now, which is not that this is going to be a, a problem like uh, earlier conflicts of the sort, but that uh, unless we're alert to some of the dangers of miscalculation, uh, we might wind up with a situation that nobody wants. So those are my thoughts on, on the relationship of the three countries, why it's important. And uh, let me just say one word in concluding about are there ways to get out of this? 
but like, I'm thinking particularly now of the Dayu and Senkaku Island situation. Uh, I've written in, 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 a, in, in, a, in a number of places and spoken that uh, one way to do this would be for uh, Japan, ideally for Japan and China, but I don't think China would agree at this point, to declare the uh, Senkaku Dayu Islands a marine ecological preserve, which would have no uh, habitation, no military uses, and which would be devoted to the larger good of the area as a whole. Uh, nobody has to uh, agree that, that this is a change of sovereignty of the islands. Uh, you can leave that issue for the future. And in that sense, what we should be looking for is to revive the wisdom of Zhou Enlai and Kakwe Tanaka, which is to put this off for future generations. Or another way to think about it is, if we have a pot on the front of the stove which is threatening to boil over, we ought to find some formula like this marine ecological preserve to slide it to the back of the stove where it will nearly simmer for, let's hope, another uh, four or five uh, decades as it did after Joe and Lai and Tanaka made their wise decision in 1972. So those are my thoughts and let me try to see if I can answer some of your questions. It's my colleague and friend Tom Patterson. Hey Joe, thank you. Uh, thanks for the, for the wonderful remarks. Uh, I'm Tom Patterson. Uh, I'm a colleague of uh, Joe's here at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School and uh, one of the co-founders of the Boston Global Forum. Um, and since uh, the forum announced your talk, Joe, uh, we've had dozens of questions mm -hmm. uh, for you come to us through the internet and um, I'd like to um, I'd like to ask you about some of them. Uh, before they before I do that, I'd like to ask you one of my own. Um, you talked about how China's soft power is handicapped by its weak uh, civil society. Um, on the other hand, China has an enviable balance sheet. Uh, it's got money that we would love to have. Uh, we wish our fiscal health was China's. Uh, and um, it's using some of that money uh, to spread its influence. Uh, we certainly did that after the Second mm -hmm. War. Uh, it was a main instrument of our soft power, the Marshall Plan, yeah. being an obvious example. Um, and uh, China is, is, is doing following that path in some ways. and. Uh, and, and yet, in some parts uh, of the world, it's getting some resistance. Uh, we saw that uh, with Myanmar, for example, and, uh, and certainly uh, some in Vietnam. Uh, and there's some suspicions uh, about exactly what China's motives might be. Uh, how well do you, do you think China is doing in using money as an instrument of soft power? Well, China has, uh, has a, uh, uh, a quite effective aid program in Africa and Latin America which I think has increased its uh, attractiveness and its soft power. Uh, it's, it has been less successful in its immediate region of, of Southeast Asia or its relations with India, for example, uh, partly because of this issue of whether it appears threatening at the same time. Uh, if, if China wanted to be more successful in using its uh, money uh, uh, in its own neighborhood, so to speak, you'll have to figure out how to combine it's hard power and soft power more effectively, uh, what I call smart power, the ability to combine the two so that one doesn't cancel the other out. But if you look at the public opinion polls that have been taken, global public opinion polls, China does quite well in, uh, in Africa, Latin America, uh, less well in its own neighborhood, and less well in Europe. Um, so the first question that we have uh, from the internet uh, I put together, I've actually cobbled together, it's from a set of questions that were asked of us by students at Peking University. Um, and the question is, what can the Japanese do to reduce the tensions resulting from the past, particularly Japanese aggression in World War II? Well, if one looks back at uh, uh, the 1930s and how Japan treated its neighbors, China and Korea, it was pretty awful. And uh, I think one of the important things is that Japan uh, has to come to terms in the 30s, and you do have that in something like the apology that Prime Minister Murakami made in, in uh, the 1990s, or the statement that Chief Cabinet Minister uh, Kono made in apologizing for the comfort women in Korea. Uh, and I think uh, the danger is that 
there are some groups in Japan now who say we're tired of apologizing. And uh, I think the recent uh, threats of reversing those statements would be very, very bad. Uh, and similarly, the Japanese Prime Minister's visit, Prime Minister Abe's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine, which uh, honors war dead from all wars and ages, but nonetheless has 14 Class A war criminals from World War II, that's very offensive to both China and Korea. And I think it was unwise for the Prime Minister to, to visit the shrine. Indeed, the American government, uh, through Ambassador Kennedy, expressed disappointment at, at the uh, at Japanese action. So we'll have to hope that uh, uh, Japan uh, maintains its apologies for a period which uh, doesn't represent Japan today. Japan today is not a militaristic uh, uh, society as it was in the 30s. Uh, and I think uh, it, it, it's important that those apologies of the 90s stay and stand in place. It's important that uh, Japanese prime ministers not um, make people think back to the 1930s by visits to the Yasukuni Shrine. So this is a related question, actually, and it comes to us from someone uh, in Tokyo. And uh, it's basically a question about what can Japan do to reach out more fully to China. Well, I think... Uh, Fortunately, the economic relations between Japan and China are good. I mean, there is a, uh, uh, there is a heavy relationship of trade. Uh, there are some students, about uh, Japanese students in China and, and Chinese students in Japan. I think those are, are steps in the right direction. Uh, but if you could find some large gesture which would indicate that Japan was willing to take a step like the one I mentioned of of declaring that the uh, Senkakus would be a uh, marine ecological preserve, that would be a way of demonstrating that Japan really is a, a peaceful society today. It's not a, it's not, it's not your 1930s Japan. It's a, and so Japanese uh, uh, officials ought to be thinking of ways that they can demonstrate uh, Japan's peaceful intentions, not merely through exchanges, which are a good thing. But through seeing if there isn't some larger gesture uh, which uh, can indicate this. Now, we have uh, an Australian journalist wrote to us on a topic that you addressed, but uh, on a dimension you didn't talk about. And he refers to the US pivot to Asia. Uh, but he is wondering about where in that pivot uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership, uh, the trade agreement mm -hmm. that's being negotiated. It's currently having some problems in Washington and, mm -hmm. and at, the, at the negotiations table, but where that where that sort of fits into this uh, triangular relationship between China, uh, Japan, and the United States. Well, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, started actually with small countries in Asia, and the idea was it started in the Bush administration. The idea was to set a higher standard for trade agreements. So. China had been accepted into the World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization, uh, the Doha round, wasn't making very rapid progress. Uh, the feeling was suppose some smaller countries were able to agree on higher standards for trade agreements. And then that gradually grew when you found uh, Japan willing to join. You found uh, Mexico and Canada, which are America's NAFTA partners being interested, so that now TPP would include about 40% uh, uh, of, of world trade if it's finally agreed upon and passed. Um, uh, at one point, China said, well, this is an anti-Chinese measure, that it's trying to contain China. And then China realized that, no, the Americans have said, in principle, if the Chinese can agree to the higher standards, China could join too. And so there has been some expression of interest in China as well. I don't think this would happen right away, but if you ask over a longer term future, is it possible? I think uh, it would be a very significant development. Well, there was even some talk this week about the next uh, meetings taking place in China. Uh, mm -hmm. the, so that would speak to that point. Uh, now, here's a question that comes from a Vietnamese national. Uh, and uh, talking about that part of the of Asia. Uh, what role can the ASEAN countries play in the relationship between the three big powers? Well, I think uh, 
the ASEAN countries have been very successful by creating a, a degree of unity. Uh, the the uh, having these countries work together uh, means that uh, there is a sense of solidarity. They develop some soft power, and I think uh, if a country is being difficult uh, toward one of these countries, the fact that it might offend uh, all the other countries as well uh, means that there's an incentive for good behavior. In 2002, China uh, talked about the idea of developing a code of conduct for settlement of disputes about uh, the South China Sea. And uh, uh, Unfortunately, that wasn't adequately developed. I think China would be wise to go back to that idea of working with ASEAN as a group to develop a code of conduct. China tends to want to develop or want to work with each of the small countries independently on the grounds that a big country like China will have more leverage when it works with one small country. That in, in one sense, that's true, but in another sense, it's not for the reasons I said earlier because it makes China look threatening. But if China were willing to deal with the ASEAN countries as a group, uh, that would make China uh, uh, look less threatening and would enhance uh, ASEAN soft power, but also China soft power. Developing soft power is not a zero-sum game. You could have an increase in soft power by both China and ASEAN, which is a win-win situation. And we haven't talked much about Korea. Uh, the next question is on that topic. Where does uh, Korea fit in this relationship between Japan, China, and the United States? Well, Korea, of course, is one of the great success stories of this recovery of Asia. I mean, if you look at uh, Korea in uh, 1960, had the same per capita income as, uh, as Ghana. And today, Korea uh, is a member of the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And it not only has had dramatic economic progress, but it's also had dramatic political progress. Uh, no longer an authoritarian country, but a country in which uh, elections lead to real changes in, in government. So I think Korea is a, is a, is a great success story and is a, a model which other countries in the region uh, can look to as one, I think, hopeful path for the future. Unfortunately, right now, the relations between Korea and Japan are not very good, and partly it goes to this issue of nationalism and the, and the uh, sense of uh, resentment about uh, threats that Japan might change statements like the Como statement on the, on the comfort women or things like the visit to the Yasunori Shrine. Uh, but I think that uh, I think it would make a lot of sense for Korea and Japan to repair their relationship, if for no other reason than the fact that uh, both of them have to ask, what happens if something goes wrong in North Korea? And given the uh, the instability, the unpredictability of the North Korean regime, uh, uh, the bad relations between Japan and South Korea is not something that either can afford. One last question, and uh, fittingly, perhaps, it's from a Kennedy School student. Uh, I better get this one right. Uh, it is said that China's foreign policy reflects what it's trying to achieve in its internal affairs. Does that insight provide any leverage in thinking about what China is likely to do in the Pacific region? I think it does help. Uh, if China were a, an aggressive country trying to take over other countries, uh, uh, remember going back to this 1914 analogy, Germany was seeking colonies in Africa and so forth. Uh, if, if China were focused outside, then one might be more worried. But China's major concern now is uh, economic development. And they regard economic development as essential, not only because, despite their impressive progress, uh, large parts of the country are still very underdeveloped, uh, south, west, and so forth. But uh, they this, they're concerned about keeping the legitimacy of the Communist Party rule. And the legitimacy of the Communist Party rule has been largely profited from this very high rate of economic development. So a loss of uh, economic development or a, a, a failure in economic development would be uh, very bad for, for China's objectives. 
So in that sense, the, the, the fact that China is focused on internal conditions, economic development and uh, political stability, uh, is, is, a, is a good thing. And now that doesn't mean there, that China couldn't make mistakes, as I indicated in my talk. You could still have a, a, a foolish policy over some small uninhabited island in the East China Sea or the South China Sea. But by and large, it, when my colleagues and I visited uh, Beijing in the in the uh, uh, 2012, uh, what one of the top leaders said to us was, uh, "We need 30 years of peace and stability and economic development if we're going to succeed." That's a hopeful sign. So, um, Joe, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, on behalf of uh, Boston Global Forum. Uh, this was the opening bell and uh, your long look at the relationship between China, Japan, and the United States, uh, that important uh, relationship and, uh, and what it might uh, pretend not only for those three countries but for the region and the world. Uh, and as uh, Governor Dukakis announced uh, in his opening statement, uh, we'll be holding three conferences over the course of the year. Uh, and on our website, uh, bostonglobalforum.com. Uh, We'll be posting materials related uh, to this discussion, uh, and we invite you to uh, continue to provide us questions, uh, and we'll do our best uh, over the course of the year to try to address them. Uh, thank you.